So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled Introduction to Culture Studies where we are reading Michel Foucault's essay What is an Author? Uh, we have already had several uh, lectures on this essay and now we're sort of just winding up now with this lecture and perhaps one more lecture after this. Now I'll just begin with where we stopped in the last lecture and that is the point where Foucault talks about trans discursivity and he talks about certain authors being founders of discursivity. So this should be on your screen at the moment. So he talks about different kinds of authorship. So he talks about authorship in scientific writing, he talks about authorship in uh, philosophical writing, in literary writings and he ma really makes it complicated and that's one of the uh, complexities of this particular essay and uh, the reason why we find this essay so illuminating in our current times. That is he breaks away from this one idea of authorship or authority, he talks about different kinds of uh, different kinds of politics of authorship which are prevalent in different discourses. So scientific discourses, literary discourses, uh, philosophical discourses, etc. And you know he talks about, uh, you know this is where we stopped the last lecture, he talks about trans discursivity and somehow you know some, some authors or some writers they become trans discursive or become founders of discursivity. So in that sense their authorship becomes more important, their authorship becomes more permanent or more timeless and more uh, monumental in certain sense than say authors of literary works, authors of scientific works, etc. And he, he just use ex examples of uh, Freud and Marx, uh, you know, and to, to just basically corroborate his point. And this is what we're going to do at this particular lecture. So, uh, so this is what he had said in the last lecture. We are discussing and just wind up a little bit, summarize a little bit, and then we'll move on to this particular lecture with the text that we'll cover in this particular, you know, uh, session. So Foucault had said in a somewhat arbitrary way we shall call those who belong to the last group as founders of discursivity. So the last group being the kind of authors, uh, the, the figures or the writers who sort of inaugurate a discourse in a way or who start a discourse, who produce a discourse which then becomes monumental, which does then becomes uh, transcultural, it moves beyond culture, it moves uh, across cultures, it moves across time, etc. So these people are maybe defined as founders of discursivity. So how are they unique? And this is the beginning of the section that we will start off with today and this should be on your screen. They are unique in that they are not just the authors of their own works, they have produced something else. The possibilities and the rules for the formation of other texts. In this sense they are very different for example, from a novelist who is in fact nothing more than the author of his own text. So uh, he talks about, again, this is what I just mentioned a couple of minutes ago where he's talking about different kinds of authorship. So he's saying over oh, yeah, here that these authors and by these authors it means um, trans discursive authors, they are not just writing a text, they are not just writing a work but they are actually inaugurating a tradition, inaugurating a particular style, a particular discourse which will then have many takers, which will have many uh, revisionists, which will have many reformers, but you know it will become a discourse in its own right. So in that sense, this kind of authorship is different ontologically as well as functionally from say writing of a novel or writing of a literary text, okay, which is more limited in its quality. Um, and then he goes on to corroborate what he's saying. Freud is not just the author of the interpretation of dreams or jokes on the relation to the unconscious. Marx is not just the author of the Communist Manifesto or Das Kapital. They both have established uh, an endless possibility of discourse. So again, this is one of the key conditions and this is a very important section uh, which I'll spend some time with. Uh, this possibility of discursive formation is something that Foucault is interested in and this is the reason why he is uh, uh, offering a niche, offering a particular subcategory of authors who are not just writers of certain texts but also they are inaugurators of certain traditions, they are inventors of certain traditions and again uh, this has to be made different from inventors of science, inventors of scientific theories and you will make the difference quite clearly in a bit. But you know, for authors who are inventors of discourses, for authors who are inventors of certain um, styles of thought, uh, they are not, not just writing a text or, or a book or a series of books, they are actually inaugurating a tradition of thought. And therein lies the difference from say literary writers or scientific writers because you know you, you might argue that even scientific writers are inventing uh, theories, inventing theorems, uh, inventing uh, different kinds of formula etc. But then Foucault argues that, that, that those formula or those theories or those theorems are already part 
of a scientific tradition, right? They are part of a system. But these writers, writers like Marx and Freud, he singles out these two people uh, quite interestingly. They are actually inaugurating a system, you know, a systematic thought or an epistemic system, you might argue. Okay, so this uh, epistemic system is something which has been inaugurated by these writers. And what that does is that it produces an endless possibility of discourse. So discourse is formed and reformed and manufactured and formulated by these kinds of trans-discursive writers. Okay, uh, so it established an endless possibility of discourse. Obviously, it's easy to object. Now, Foucault is the first to say that, you know, it's easy to refute this theory. It's easy to say that, you know, how can you say that a literary writer does not uh, produce a discourse? How can you say a literary writer does not produce a style? I mean, there are numerous examples of literary writers who have produced styles which have become important and monumental and which have been followed uh, by several other writers subsequently. So how is that different from uh, Marx or Freud? And this is what he uh, goes on to say, and this should be on your screen at the moment. One might say that it is not true that the author of a novel is only the author of his own text. In a sense, he also provided that he acquires some importance, governs and commands more than that. To take a very simple example, one could say that Anne Radcliffe not only wrote The Castle of Atherland or Dunbayne uh, and several other novels, but also made possible the appearance of the Gothic horror novel at the beginning of the 19th century. So, you know, he's saying that, you know, one might argue that someone like Anne Radcliffe uh, inaugurated the Gothic horror tradition of literary writing. So how can that not, that not be an example of uh, transdiscursivity? How can that not be an example of the author function that, you know, Marx of Freud enjoy? How is it different? Uh, someone like Anne Radcliffe, who you know begins to have a tradition, offers a tradition which is then taken up by several other writers subsequently. So how is that not part of the same, uh, you know, uh, authorship uh, production, uh, authorship uh, ontology, right? So how is that different? Uh, but then this is what Foucault would argue. So uh, in that sense, her author function exceeds her own work. So in that argument, strictly speaking, one would argue that you know Anne Radcliffe is not just the writer of the Castle of Atlean or Dunbane, but she is a inaugurator of the Gothic horror tradition of literary writing. So that too is a valid argument. But this is what Foucault says. But I think there is an answer to this objection. These founders of discursivity, I use Marx and Freud as examples because I believe them to be both the first and the most important cases, make possible something altogether different from what a novelist makes possible. So the difference lies in the possibility, the difference lies in the uh, the production that comes out of the possibility. So you know, he makes a mapping out quite clear over here. Anne Radcliffe's text open the way for a certain number of resemblances and analogies which have the model or principle in their work. So Anne Radcliffe offered a model which was then taken up, imitated mimetically uh, or you know, uh, through different writings subsequently. So it was a model that was followed uh, later on uh, through analogies. So people who wrote in that tradition, uh, we could say that they were making analogous uh, uh, relationship to Anne Radcliffe's idea of the horror, the Gothic horror novel. The latter contains characteristic signs, figures, relationships and structures that could be reused by others. In other words, to say that Anne Radcliffe founded the Gothic horror novel means that in the 19th century Gothic novel one will find, as in Anne Radcliffe's works, the theme of the heroine caught up in the trap of her own innocence, the hidden castle, the character of the black, cursed hero devoted to making the world expiate the evil done to him, and all the rest of it. So what he's saying essentially is, you know, Anne Radcliffe, by offering the Gothic horror tradition uh, of writing, uh, she had offered a set of themes, a set of props, a set of uh, strategies, a set of styles, a set of um, structures which were then you know, replicated and followed by writers subsequently. So you know, he mentions a few uh, strategies and a few themes over here, the innocent heroine, uh, the cursed hero, the doomed castle. So these are the props, these are the figures, these are the uh, different structures which keep coming up in that kind of writing. But on the other hand, when I speak of Marx or Freud, as founders of discursivity, I mean that they made possible not only a certain number of analogies, but also an equally important, a certain number of differences. So therein lies a the difference. So he's saying when it comes to uh, looking at Marx and Freud, uh, they not just offered structures or styles or, or tropes or props or figures, but they also offered a tradition from which people could differ. Right? And difference creates more possibilities. Difference creates uh, difference makes production more possible, right? And we've seen how difference plays out in uh, different political contexts and uh, you know, in various uh, 
discursive context. So think of Homi Bhabha, think of uh, um, Orwell's essay, and you know the other texts we covered so far. And what Foucault is saying over here is the difference over here is equally important. So it's not just analogies, it's not just reputations, and it's not just structural reputations, stylistic reputations, figurative reputations. There are also differences. So there, there's a whole host of writers and thinkers uh, who drew on Marx, who drew on Freud, and then differed from Freud and differed from Marx. And therein lies the possibility. The difference produces this possibility. And that makes Freud and Marx transdiscursive in a way that it doesn't make Anne Ratcliffe transdiscursive. So Anne Ratcliffe's works, despite being inaugurators uh, of certain literary traditions, they are limited to stylistic traditions. They're limited to uh, literary tropes. They're, they're limited to certain themes, which are then replicated and, uh, you know, followed and agreed on by subsequent writers. But Freud and Marx, they're more important because people have also drawn on them to differ from them, to deviate from them. And the difference lies, the, the, the difference lies in a difference, uh, just to play with words a little bit. Okay, so uh, they have created a possibility for something other than the discourse, yet something belonging to what they founded. So, you know, something which uh, has to be drawn from the discourse, but at the same time, they have made possible new kinds of discourses, which have emerged from the original discourses. So the Freudian tradition of thinking, Freudian tradition of psychoanalysis, the Marxist idea of economy, uh, people have disagreed vehemently with those traditions, but at the same time, the disagreements are, are reliant on the original models. So they have offered discursive possibilities, they offer, also offer discursive differences, and therein lies uh, the significance of these two figures. To say that Freud founded psychoanalysis does not simply mean that we find the concept of the libido or the technique of dream analysis in the works of Carl Abraham or Melanie Klein. It means that Freud made possible a certain number of divergences with respect to his own text, concepts and hypothesis that all arise from the psychoanalytic discourse itself. So th that particular psychoanalytic discourse, it created a possibility of other discourses similar to it, but also and equally importantly, uh, it also made possible discourses which differed from it, discourses which were divergence from it, okay? And therein lies the, uh, the monumentality, the significance of these discursive thinkers, of these writers who have become more than writers because they have become founders of certain discourses, right? And so that's the key difference that um, uh, Foucault is mapping out over here. So he's saying it's possible, it's perfectly possible for a writer, a literary writer, uh, to invent a particular style that others, other writers will follow subsequently. So you can think of the modernist dream, stream, uh, stream of consciousness technique, you can think of the uh, postmodernist unreliable narrator technique. So all these are styles which are followed subsequently by other writers. But uh, what makes Freud or Marx more important and more transdiscursive is that they're not just offering styles, they're not just offering structures, they're offering systems of thought, they're offering an epistemic system that people can differ from. But even the difference, even the divergence from that epistemic system would require a certain degree of tribute to it, a certain degree of uh, drawing on it, okay? So therein lies a the key difference between transdiscursive writers and literary writers who found certain traditions. Okay, now he comes to the other uh, problem, the other uh, possible uh, question. How about, what about writers who write in a scientific tradition, writers who invent theories, writers who invent formula? I mean, you can also make the argument that they are inventing a certain uh, tradition of scientific thinking, a certain tradition of um, scientific analysis, etc. So how is that that they are not considered to be transdiscursive writers in a way that uh, Marx and Freud are? So this is the next section that Foucault is examining. And see, this is again uh, a really key characteristic, a key mark, you might say, of a really great intellectual, that he's offering you the different possibilities that you can use to refute him. So he's offering some theories, at the same time he's giving you the different perspectives that you can use to refute those theories, and then he's backing those theories. So it really requires a huge amount of uh, confidence, a huge amount of epistemological certainty, epistemological confidence, uh, epistemological openness to do this. And this is what Freud, uh, what, what Foucault offers over here, and this is what the characteristics, you might argue, of almost all great public intellectuals, that they offer the different perspectives, they offer the different ways in which, in which you can attack them, in which you can refute them. I mean, they are the ones who tell you, okay, so I'm offering this theory, and these are the ways you can refute this theory, but then, uh, if you refute it that way, I will defend my theory in this particular way. So they establish a very dialogic structure in their, uh, in their essay. So he's also offering uh, the different possibilities of refutation of his own theory within the same essay, okay? And that makes the essay very dialogic in quality. Okay, 
this would seem to present a new difficulty. However, or at least a new problem, uh, it is about um, is it about not true for after all for any founder of a science or any author who has introduced some transformation into a science that might be called fecund right so what about uh, the rich the fecund scientific thought scientific theorem scientific theory scientific formula uh, how is that not transdiscursive how is that not uh, monumental in the same way as Marx and Freud are uh, I mean for instance you could argue that someone who invents a theorem someone who invents a particular formula uh, that particular person that particular figure inaugurates a certain tradition of authorship, inaugurates a certain tradition of analysis. So how is that different from uh, the, the unique significance of someone like Marx or Freud? And you know, this is what Foucault is arguing and this is what Foucault is defending over here. Okay? After all, Galileo made possible not only those discourses which repeated the laws he had formulated, but also statements very different from what he himself had said. If George Scavure is the founder of biology, or Ferdinand Cezor, the founder of linguistics, it is not because they were imitated, not because people have since taken up again the concept of organism or sign. It is because Scavure made possible, to a certain extent, a theory of evolution diametrically opposed to his own fixism. It is because Cezor made possible a generative grammar radically different from the structural analysis. Superficially, then, the initiation of discursive practices appears similar to the founding of any scientific endeavor. So you're saying, at least if you read it at a superficial level, the initiator of a discursive practice, you know, it sounds exactly similar to the founder of any uh, scientific endeavor. So how is that different? How is the initiation of a discursive practice different or unique compared to, uh, say, uh, the founder or the initiation or the inventor of a scientific endeavor? Uh, so what is the difference here? Still, there is a difference, and this is why he denotes the difference. Still, there is a difference, and a notable one. In the case of a science, the act that founds it is on an equal footing with the future transformations. This act becomes, in some respects, part of the set of modifications that uh, it makes possible. Of course, this belonging can take different forms. In a future development of a science, the founding act may appear as little more than a particular instance of a more general phenomenon that unveils itself in the process. It can also turn out to be, to be marred by intuition or an empirical bias. One must then reformulate it, making it the object of a certain number of supplementary um, theoretical operations that establish it more rigorously and so on. Finally, it can seem to be a hasty generalization that must be retraced. In other words, the founding act of a science can always be reintroduced within the machinery of those transformations which derive from it. So, what he's saying essentially is, you know, if we invent a theory, if we invent a theorem, if we invent a formula in the scientific tradition, that that particular theorem, that particular theory is already belonging to a certain tradition. Right? So, it's not really a departure from a tradition. It extends the tradition, it extends the particular epistemic system, right? but at the same time, it belongs to the particular tradition. So, in a way, uh, the discursive initiation that Freud offers or Marx offers is a dramatic departure from anything that came before it. Right. However, uh, even a, a, you know, a basically a, a life-changing uh, scientific theorem like Galilean theorem or the or the Copernican theorem, uh, so they too belong to a certain tradition which they drew from. Right. And therein lies a the difference. They always drew from a certain epistemic structure, a certain epistemic economy. Right. Uh, and in that sense, it is not really an initiator of a new discourse. Okay. So. Uh, in contrast to that, when it comes to a discursive initiation or a discursive inauguration, what do we see? In contrast, and this is on your screen, in contrast, the initiation of a discursive practice is heterogeneous to its subsequent transformations. To expand a type of discursivity, such as psychoanalysis, as founded by Freud, is not to give it a form generality it would have permitted at the outset, but rather to open it up to a certain number of possible applications. So, the key difference is in the form as well as in the function. Okay, the form of this discursive inauguration uh, is not general, right? It is open, it is plastic, it can be taken up in different configurations and different times. In contrast to that, if you look at a scientific formula, it's a general formula, right? It's a general formula that belongs to a particular tradition, and in that sense, it's not really plastic, it's not really open, it's not really uh, permutable uh, in, in different other contexts. It belongs to a strict tradition. 
uh, of a piston rake analysis. But in a, in a discursive uh, inauguration and discursive practice, uh, it's not really a general formula. It is something which is very specific, at the same time it's very open. And this uh, entanglement of specificity and openness is what makes a discursive practice uh, unique in quality, you know, this entanglement of this combination between specificity and openness. To limit psychoanalysis as a type of discursivity is, in reality, to try to isolate in the founding act an eventually restricted number of propositions or statements to which alone one grants the founding value, and in relation to which certain concepts or theories accepted by Freud might be considered as derived, secondary, and accessory. In addition, one does not declare certain propositions in a work of these founders to be false. Instead, when trying to seize the act of founding, one sets aside uh, those statements that are not pertinent, either because they are deemed essential or because they are considered prehistoric and derived from another type of discursivity. In other words, unlike the founding of a science, the initiation of a discursive practice does not participate in these later transformations. As a result, one defines the proposition's theoretical validity in relation to the works of the founders, while in the case of Galileo and Newton, it is in relation to what physics or cosmology is in its intrinsic structure and normativity that one affirms the validity of any propositions those men may have put forth. To phrase it very schematically, the works of initiators of discursivity is not situated in the space the science defines. Rather, it's a science of the discursivity which refers back to the work as primary coordinates. Okay, so this is a key difference. Uh, it doesn't matter. So th the work of Freud or the work of Marx doesn't really matter. I mean, to the extent to which it can be applicable later and can be gone back to originally. So in the case of science, for instance, if we take the Galileo example, uh, it can only be true if it stays within a particular tradition, if it stays within a particular narrative of epistemic analysis. So only within that narrative does it have its applicability, only within that narrative does it have its particular function, its particular form. Whereas if you look at the discursive practices, it does not require, it does not require any particular narrative at all. It can be applied to you from different perspectives, from different positions, from different points of historical time. So in a way, it becomes uh, meta-historical, it becomes, you know, it does not really depend, it does not really matter. Uh, from what historical position you're analyzing it, right? So it, it transcends any particular uh, parameter of knowledge. You know, it can be used uh, almost universally. It can be used uh, any context, and therein lies the difference. Therein lies the, uh, you know, the discursive function uh, of these thinkers, of these writers, Marx and Freud, that they belong to a tradition which is meta-discursive in quality. It's a creator of a discourse at the same time. It's not consumed by any particular discourse, right? So therein lies the uniqueness of these writers. Okay, in this way we can understand the inevitable necessity within these fields of discursivity for a return to the origin. This return which is in part of the discursive field itself never stops modifying it. The return is not a historical supplement that would be added to the discursivity or merely an ornament. On the contrary, it constitutes a, an effective and necessary task of transforming the dis discursive practice itself. Re-examination of Galileo's text may well change our understanding of the history of mechanics, but it will never be able to change the mechanics itself. On the other hand, re-examining Freud's text modifies psychoanalysis itself, just as a re-examination of Marx would modify Marxism. So in this particular sentence really sums it up for us. That if, for instance, if we re-examine Galileo's text, you know, Galileo's formula, Galileo's theories, etc., it will not change the law of mechanics, it will not change the narrative of mechanics, right? So, Galileo's text or Galileo's work uh, is well within the laws of mechanics, so it will not change, it's, it, it's not outside of that particular law of mechanics. So, in that sense, Galileo's work is not really an inaugurator of a tradition, it becomes an extension of a tradition. Right. So changing Galileo's work will not change mechanics, will not change the theories of mechanics or the formula of mechanics. But on the other hand, if you change, if you go back and re-examine Freud's text, if you go back and re-examine uh, you know, Marxist writings, then the entire narrative of psychoanalysis changes, the entire narrative of um, uh, Marxism changes. So in that sense, Marx and Freud really belong to the inaugurator, the, the in inception point, the zero point, uh, the origin point of that particular discursive narrative. Right. So. The discourse starts with them, the discourse begins with them. So any change in, an, in understanding, any change in an examination of Freud or Marx will change the entire ontology of Marxism, the entire ontology of psychoanalysis. 
and therein lies a key difference between a scientific discovery and a discursive discovery. So a discursive discovery, a discursive invention such as Marxism or psychoanalysis uh, is completely reliant on the original uh, proponent, the original author, in this case it's Marx or Freud. Right? So if we re-examine Freud's work, if we re-examine Marx's works, it will change the entire ontology, the entire epistemic structure of Marxism and psychoanalysis. However, if you change, if you re-examine Galileo's work, uh, then Galileo's works will become different. Galileo's works will be, will get a different kind of appreciation. However, that will not change, that will not alter fundamentally uh, the laws of mechanics. The laws of mechanics will stay unchanged in that sense. The narrative of mechanics will stay unchanged in that sense, okay. So in that sense, what he's saying essentially is, scientific discoveries or scientific writers, uh, they might offer paradigm shifts uh, in, in, in a way we look at science, in a way we look at different kinds of scientific laws. However, those paradigm shifts too are embedded uh, in an existing discourse, an existing narrative of knowledge. However, when it comes to uh, someone like Freud or Marx, they are the initiators or the inaugurators of that particular discourse. They are the beginning of that particular narrative. So they are the origin point, the, the uh, the point zero from which that particular narrative begins. So any change in their work, any change in our, in our assessment of their work will change the entire structure, the entire function, the entire ontology, the entire epistemology of that particular narrative, whether it's Marxism or psychoanalysis, okay. So uh, what I have just outlined regarding these discursive insaturations is of course very schematic. This is true in particular of the opposition I have tried to draw between discursive initiation and scientific founding. It is not always easy to distinguish between the two. Moreover, nothing proves that they are the two mutually exclusive procedures. So now again, this is the uh, look at the confidence in Foucault's works and, and, his, and his thoughts. It's very quick to tell you uh, what I'm saying is by no means conclusive. You know, you can always challenge me. Uh, I'm making these convenient classifications, but you know, these classifications might not work at all. So scientific discourses and discursive practices might come together, and they very often do. So it's not really wise all the time to map it out, map these out uh, as a neat ontological category. So it is perfectly possible for these two types of knowledge, these two types of narratives to be interdependent on each other, okay. Moreover, uh, nothing proves that they are two mutually exclusive procedures, so they may, may not be necessarily exclusive procedures. Uh, I have attempted the distinction for only one reason, to show that the author function which is a complex enough for one when tries to situate at the level of a book or a series of texts that carry a given signature involves still more determining factors when one tries to analyze it in larger units such as groups of workers, groups of works or entire disciplines. So the entire uh, this particular passage was done to define the author function in a particular way. So he says, you know, I have made these differences, it's very artificial differences between scientific writing, discursive writing, literary writing, it's just to uh, corroborate a certain kind of author function that I was trying to prove or trying to sort of explain over here. So just to sum up what uh, Foucault had discussed in this particular section that we have studied in this lecture, he talks about the unique author function which is trans-discursive in quality. Uh, an author function which becomes the inaugurator of a certain tradition of thought, right, and it makes a difference between uh, the literary authorship or scientific authorship and this kind of authorship, which is discursive authorship, you might argue. And this discursive authorship, which becomes transdiscursive, they literally become founders of certain narratives of knowledge in a way that a scientific invention or a literary writing cannot be, because any literary writing belongs to a certain tradition, right, or any scientific invention belongs to a certain tradition, right, and if you change that particular scientific writing, if it changed that particular literary writing, it will not change the entirety of the tradition. However, if you change, hypothetically speaking, if you change the writings of Marx or the writings of Freud, if you re-examine and find out they are completely different, that will completely and entirely and fundamentally change the entire narrative of knowledge which they produce. And therein lies the uniqueness as transdiscursive author functions, okay. So this is what uh, Foucault discusses in this particular session and with that we conclude this lecture and we will conclude this particular essay in our next lecture. Thank you for your attention.